Hello and welcome to the Programming with QT SPIM tutorial. This video is intended for students entering Georgia Tech's ECE 3056 class, Architecture, Concurrency, and Energy and Computation. Please note that because ECE 2035 is a prerequisite for this course, this video assumes a basic understanding of the MIPS assembly language. This video is not intended to be an introduction to MIPS, but rather to show you some of the new things you can do with MIPS in QT SPIM as opposed to other simulators you may have used in the past, such as MISSISM. This tutorial will show you where and how you can download QTSPIM, give you a basic rundown of the QTSPIM user interface, and finally show you some of the kinds of programs you can run in QTSPIM via some simple programming examples. First of all, you're going to be downloading QTSPIM from a site that looks like this here. I'll include a link to this page in the description below. Once here, you'll simply click on the link to begin downloading QT SPIM. Note that there are different links for different operating systems, so use the link that corresponds to the operating system that you use. The download shouldn't take more than a few minutes, so if you have not already done so, you should go ahead and do so now. Uh, once it's downloaded, just install. Once again, shouldn't take very long. It's a fairly simple procedure. Once you've got QT SPIM installed, you can go ahead and run it. When QTSPIM opens, you should see a window that looks like this. You may notice that a second window also opened when you opened QTSPIM. This window is called the console. I won't be using this right off the bat, but I will explain what that's for a little later. Anyway, when you've got QTSPIM open, you'll see several panes filled with text in them. This first largest pane here is the data and text segment pane text segment lists the steps of your program as it's running, and the data segment shows whatever you got stored in memory. You can switch back and forth between the data and text segment using these tabs at the top of the pane here. Next, over here on the left, you'll see the registers pane. This lists all 32 standard registers, as well as the high-low registers and the program counter, and shows what's in them at any given point in your program. You may notice up here at the top in the menu, you've got the registers and data segment options. Using these options, you can change how the registers or the data segment pane uh, shows data. You can be shown in binary, or hexadecimal, or decimal. We'll just leave them both in hex for now. And finally, down here at the bottom, we've got the messages pane. This just tells you whatever's going on in QT SPIM at any given time. Uh, after you run your program, this pane will tell you if your program compiled correctly and whether or not there were any errors. So you're going to want to glance down here every time you run one of your programs. Now, before we move on to our first programming example, I'm going to briefly go over the register naming convention. If you look over here at the registers pane, you'll notice next to each register there's a second name for that register listed in brackets. This name consists of a number and a letter which denotes its functionality. For instance, registers 8 through 15 are T registers or temporaries. These registers hold a value and are not considered saved over a function call. And down here are the S or saved registers, which do the same thing but are considered saved over a function call. You should all remember the load save convention for calling functions in MIPS. Also, there are some special registers, such as the SP, or stack pointer, and the RA, return address. Obviously, any register can be of the type the programmer chooses, so long as it is specified in the program description. This just provides you with a convenient way to remember each register's type. You can choose to name your registers this way, or simply use the original method, it's up to you. With that said, we'll now move on to our first example program. For starters, we'll be looking at a simple program that performs some simple memory operations. You can write your programs using any text editor. However, documents use, written using more complicated text editors, such as Microsoft Word, tend not to mesh with QT SPIM very well. So I would recommend using a more basic Word editor, such as Notepad. Anyway, as you can see in the program description here, this program just performs some basic storing and loading to and from memory. In the data segment, we see two arbitrary values are stored at locations L1 and L2. 
and four bytes of space are saved are reserved in this location. Next, in the text segment, every program written for Qt Spim should begin with the line .global main and the label main at the beginning of your program. So to begin, we see the values stored in L1 and L2 are loaded into registers T0 and T1. Then bitwise AND and OR are performed on those values. And finally, the value stored in to register T3 is stored to the four bytes of space that were reserved earlier. You notice these two lines down here. I'll explain a little more about what these two lines are and what they do a little later. But for now, just know that these two lines are needed to end every program run in Qt Spim. Once you've saved your program in the text editor, you'll need to load your program into Qt Spim. You can do this using the reinitialize and load instruction right here, also right here. Once your program loads, you'll notice a few immediate changes to the user interface. In the text segment pane, the instructions of your program should have appeared. And also, in the data segment pane, the values that you stored in the data segment and the space you reserved should also appear. So at this point, we're ready to begin simulating. We'll do this using the options under the simulator tab in the upper menu here, also found right here. The run option will simply cause your program to run until it reaches the end or an interrupt. Pause and stop are self-explanatory, but you probably won't use them much due to the fact that MIPS programs run so quickly, it's all but impossible to pause or stop in the middle. And finally, of course, there's single stepping, which simply causes your program to execute one instruction at a time. So to begin, we're going to start by single stepping through this program. Uh, you'll notice that a few instructions that are not yours will always execute first. Don't worry about these. These won't mess with your program at all. Once you reach the instruction JAL main, the next program, the next instruction to execute will be the first instruction of your program. So here we've reached the point where we're going to be loading the first value. Now if you see over on the left here, the first value has been loaded into the register T0, just as in the program. Now the second value is now in register T1. Next, bitwise AND and bitwise OR are both computed. And finally, look in the data segment here. The next thing to happen should be the value in T3 stored in memory. And as you can see, it's now there. At this point, you should be able to see the utility in single stepping. If your program is not executing correctly, you can simply single step through it and watch the values in the registers and in memory as they change. Uh, it's great for debugging, so you can discern where and how your program is having problems. Anyway, once the program has reached its end, if you want to run, if you want to start the simulation over again, you will need to reinitialize and load the same file again. Now then, as I mentioned before, the run button causes your program to run continuously until it reaches either the end of the program or an interrupt. Uh, which in this case will simply be the end of the program. So as you can see, it's already done all the calculations and stored the value in memory. So we will now move on to our next subject, which will be pseudo instructions. So if you've written a lot of programs in MIPS, you may have been frustrated by the rather limited nature of the MIPS instruction set architecture. Of course, that's how it's supposed to be. But now with Qt Spim, we have access to what's called pseudo instructions. Pseudo instructions makes MIPS a little more versatile by adding a few new instructions for us to use. How this works is when Qt Spim encounters a pseudo instruction, it will automatically translate it into one or more native instructions. So we will still be using the same core ISA, 
Pseudo instructions just make it easier for you, the programmer, to set up the kind of logic you want. To demonstrate this, we'll be looking at this program here. This is just a simple program that computes the sum of an array of elements. So we'll go ahead and load this into Qt Spin and start single stepping through it. The first pseudo instruction we come across is LA, which stands for load address. This simply loads the, address, the base address of this array L1 into register T0. Immediately after that, we see LI, or load immediate which loads the immediate value 4 into register T1. You see in this right column here is the program as it was written in the word editor, and over here in this left column is the program as it actually executes in Qt spim. So you can see how these pseudo instructions were translated into native instructions. So for now, we'll just single step for a little while until we come across the next pseudo instruction which is BGT, or branch of greater than. You may recall in the core ISA, there are only two different kinds of branch instructions, branch of equal and branch of not equal. With pseudo instructions, we now have access to a wider variety of branch instructions, such as branch of greater than, branch of less than, branch of greater than or equal to, and so on. This just makes setting up conditional logic a little easier. Because this branch of greater than combines the functionality of a set of less than, and a branch if not equal. The final pseudo instruction we see in this program is move. This simply moves the value in register T2 into register S1. Now, this, these are just a few of the different examples of pseudo instructions. In the comments below the video, I will include a link to a more exhaustive list of pseudo instructions. This list spells out the names of the pseudo instructions, shows how they're implemented, and shows the native instructions that they translate to. You may want to take a look at this list just to give yourself a better idea of the kinds of things pseudo instructions can be used for. Finally, I'm going to explain the purpose of syscalls. You've probably noticed by now that every program thus far has ended with a syscall instruction. Syscalls are very important in Qt spim as they control all user input output operations in addition to ending every program. To help explain this, we'll move on to our final example program. This program shows you a few different uses for syscalls. Basically, what this program does is request an integer value as input, doubles it, and prints the result back to the console. All input-output operations in Qt spim take place in the console window. To begin, the operation performed by the syscall is determined by the value in register V0. In this case, the value 4 will print a string from memory to the console, the base address of which should be stored in register A0. Next, the value 5 will request an integer input from the user, the response of which will be stored back to the register V0. Then, the input value is doubled and stored in register A0. The value 1 in V0 will then print the integer output to the console. Finally, the value 10 in V0 will cause the program to end. This is why every program running Qt spim must end with these two lines. Now, we'll run this program in Qt spim. Here we see the string from before printed to the console, so it's awaiting input from me. So I'll use the number 15. And there, we see it's been doubled and printed back to the console. For a complete list of syscall operations, see the SPIM quick reference guide link in the description below. And that is the final programming example for this video. You should now have a basic understanding of how to simulate programs in Qt SPIM. For a more complete understanding of all these subjects, you should go ahead and write and run a few simple examples of your own. This concludes the Programming with QT SPIM tutorial. Good luck to all of you, and happy coding.